Mr. Lincoln Kokaram. Lincoln, what's up, man? How you doing, dude? I'm doing very well. Hope. Awesome, man. So this is our very first uh, YouTube live session. We're kind of experimenting at the same time. We're going to have an awesome conversation. Um, uh, for the ones that follow the podcast, you know, we are off season here until about September, but I wanted to do a couple of these special, special sessions, excuse me, between now and then just to, um, talk about some things that, um, maybe are not so specific to the dealership world. And, um, but yet there could be some takeaways for people in the industry and then any, anybody else that, um, is just looking for, um, you know, some, some best practices. So very excited for this, for this session. Um, we're going to be talking about, I mean, look, uh, these are free flowing conversations, but we were, we're one of, one of the things that we want to cover, or as far as the topic is we want to talk about passion and not necessarily, um, uh, you know, we don't want to box that into any specific category, but maybe, you know, uh, leading with passion or selling with passion. Um, so I'm very, very excited for this, for this deal. Um, Let's get into it, uh, Lincoln. I, I typically start things off with a with a background, just so that, you know people know a little bit more about what you've done in the past and kind of what you what you're doing currently. So okay. I'll, I'll kick it off there, man. All right, Herb. Well, well, you know, you and I both worked at, at Auto Trader, um, Cox Enterprises. I I worked that was my last quote unquote corporate gig. I worked there from 2008 until 2015, and while I was there. I got to engage in quite a few or with quite a few auto dealers all over the country. Um, I was a learning manager. They sent me to the dealers to, to coach and train the salespeople. Yeah. Also, you had to set up and manage live streams. Sorry about YouTube that. We're having some room. technical difficulties. Apologies. That's okay. what happens when you, when you <laughs> experiment. Sorry about that, man. No, that's all right. So, you know, and before that, you know, I, I, I was born in Trinidad and Tobago. My background was, you know, I, my first real job was a school teacher. And, and that, was not, that was something that I, I have to say I fell into you, or kind of like a divine intervention kind of thing. It was not my goal. But I, and you know what? I loved it. I loved it. And I realized this is not a job. I get... I get an opportunity to make a difference in the lives of these young kids. And, and I'm living the, the rewards today. 50 years later, I met one of my pupils last week, Annabelle, who had so much good things to say about me. You know, and, and how I, I loved them and cared about them. And I was about just about five or six years older than these kids, but I loved it. Yeah, dude, isn't it awesome? Isn't it awesome? Sorry to interject here, but you're, you're bringing up a, a good point and it just brought a thought to my mind. But isn't it awesome that as human beings, we may have, um, you know, we're just interacting, right? We're doing what we do. Like in your case, you're a teacher, you're, you're teaching kids or whatever on a daily basis. That's what you do. And not to say that, you know, you probably enjoy it, right? But you're talking to so many different people and you never know what that one thing that you say or that one person that you pay that extra special attention to the impact that you're going to have in that person's life career or whatever you know what i mean and so it's just uh it's you know as you said that 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 thought came to my mind because somebody recently was asking me to name one teacher in my kind of in my background that that i could look back to and be like wow you know that person's is, is somebody that you know, had a, a lasting impact in my life. And so anyway, I just kind of wanted to interject. You know, you're, you're, you're very correct in that statement. We don't know how, what we say or what we do, how it impacts other people. For example, when I was leaving the elementary school to go off to college, a young girl came up to my car and she said to me, bye-bye daddy. Herb, no amount of money can compensate for that feeling. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, and this happened in, in 1973. And I will never forget that as long as I live. And today, you know, with Facebook and all social media, I'm getting texts, I'm getting messages from people who have been to my workshops and say, you know, you touched me. 
you know, in, in my book, you know, and, and if, you, if we have time, I like to read this testimonial. Yeah, man, go for it, dude. Okay. It's, it said, and, and this is page three of my book titled With Passion. And it says, Lincoln, thank you again for making the trip to Denver last week. As promised, I'm taking a minute to email you about how your workshop on passion has improved my life. So 30 days has passed since our meeting in Phoenix and the letter I had written to my family, 13 week old daughter, had arrived in the mail. I knew what it was instantly as it was sorted out of the pile of junk mail. My wife asked, what's this? It looks like your handwriting. We opened it together and I read it aloud proudly. She then asked, is this what you've been working on? I have noticed a difference in you. I was a little stunned. I thought of the changes I'm making as internal. I was pleasantly surprised to know that my wife perceived the changes on the outside too. Thanks again for the way you bring passion into your presentations with us. It really makes a difference. That's why I do what I do. Um, that's why I do what I do. All right. So let's talk about that for a second, because I mean, right, listen, we can take this in so many different directions, but um, let's talk about uh, let's let's try and get to the core first, right? As we expand on this concept, because it's you know obviously there's there's a lot there, but so why is it you know in your opinion why is it that there's people that you see they're doing something and you can tell that they're absolutely passionate about that thing there's no question it's undeniable but the majority of people seem to be looking for that for that thing and never really find it or never really uh, um you know kind of it, you know put in the time or the the effort required to attain it and so um you know, they're just kind of wandering, right? Or they're just conforming to um, whatever the case may be, right? Whatever their, their life situation is. And let me just give you an example. So I, I'm of the belief that the human mind has such capacity, right? That oh, yeah. we, 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 you know, and, and that can go both ways, right? If we don't, if we don't uh, utilize it for, for our own benefit, then it can be to our detriment. But um, you know, human beings will spend years, like 20 years, 30 years being miserable, right? In a job that they hate, you know what I mean? And they'll go and they'll do it over and over and over and over again, every day in and out, because it provides a certain amount of security in their life, right? Whether it be a paycheck and benefits and the whole thing, right? Yet they will not, right? The majority of us will not invest in ourselves to find the thing that, you know, we're passionate about, that we love, that's, that's, that would, completely change our life. It would be a completely different life experience because we're afraid or there's fear of failure and all these things. So why is it that some of us are lucky enough to find that? Is it because we invest in ourselves and we, or do we stumble upon it by accident? Um, you know, in your opinion, like how do we get to that place where we, um, you know, not only are, are, are doing things with passion, but we actually find it, right? We actually um, get to this place where we, where, we, where we identify, we know what it is, um, and we, we say, okay, this is it, this is what I'm meant to do, and then just go full force after it. You know, that's a really good question, Herb. And it's a couple of things. First, it's intention. The human being, is the only living organism and creation that has the power of free will to choose. Well, many people have not discovered that yet. They allow circumstances and other people to push their buttons and lead them where the other people want them to go instead of making a choice. You, we need to learn to choose. Every day, I choose to make the best of this situation. I choose to, to be joyful at, at what I do. It's not about what I am doing it, but why I am doing it. I tell my people who I coach and who I train, make a why list and have it, have it there available why I do it. So when things happen and things happen that will upset us and will want us to quit, we have that to remind us, this is why I have to go through with this and this too shall pass. Make a wine list and be intent to enjoy what you do. It doesn't matter what you're doing. I remember once 
I was in a hotel in Orlando. I was doing a workshop. And this guy, oh, this man was cleaning toilets. And guess what? He was whistling. He had so, so much peace and his toilet was sparkling clean. He was not focused on what he was doing. He was focusing on why he was doing it. And make and then choose to enjoy it. For, for, and I tell this story a lot. I like one of my favorite stories. When I was single, I never make up the bed until like the weekend when I had to change the sheet. <laughs> you know? <laughs> because my, my philosophy, my mindset was, I'm going to go back in that bed tonight. Why should I make it up now? You know, I'll make it up when I, when I change the sheets. Well, I got married to my wife. Her name is Vilma. Talk about a neat freak. And she wants the bed make up every morning. And then, oh, it's, I got 14 pillows on the bed. I'm not exaggerating. And I'm thinking, we only need one each. Where we got 14? <laughs> and anyway, so we made a deal. And we said, all right, V, whoever gets off the bed last makes up the bed, OK? Oh, you know who's getting off the bed first every day now? <laughs> <laughs> Until one Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> One Saturday morning, oops, she got me. I slept in. She got me. I said, I'm looking at this bed. And these are the thoughts that are going through my mind. Yeah, you know, it's it's it, you, you bring up a good point there. Like, um, you know, like you, you gave the example of the guy cleaning toilets, whistling, having a good time or whatever. I don't know if he was having a good time, but it's it, by your story, it sounds like he was enjoying his work, right? And that's fine. Listen, you know, like, I don't, I, I don't think it's the, the what you're doing for work, if it's what you want to do, if it brings you some sort of joy and, and pleasure, right? Because I think that the human, the human condition is to be producing whatever it may be, right? And so, um, but, I, you know, I, I also think that a lot of us have, especially now with social media, man, I think that there's a lot of... Um, we get this concept of success kind of twisted, right? And confused. We, we associate that with money and power and fame and all these things. And um, that's not necessarily how we should look at it. It's, it should be like to your, to your point, to your example, it should be about doing what you love to do, right? Um, every single day you get to do it. Um, and, and, and based on whatever your definition of success is, right? To me, the def my definition of success is, success to me is, you know, am I living up to my potential, right? It's not what I've attained so far to this point in my life is, am I living up to my potential? If I can say honestly that I'm living up to my potential, hey, today I woke up and I did everything that I was, that I could possibly do to live up to my potential. To me, that's a good day, man. You know what I mean? And, and maybe not a whole lot happened for the regular folk, but for me, that, 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 that's success, right? And so um, do you think that we, when, when it comes to passion and doing the things that we love and, 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 you know, living a successful life, do you think that we get that confused because we don't define what success is for us and, and we leave that, we kind of take whatever society definition of success is and then we try to attain that and it just doesn't fit in our life? Well, well look, the, the thing about it is we've been taught from growing up that you got to get an education and you got to go work hard. Nobody taught me that I must go and enjoy what I do. In fact, in mm -hmm. the culture that I grew up, it, it they would tell you if you enjoy what you do, you're not working, which is an oxymoron, you know. No, the more I enjoy what I do, the more I do. The more I enjoy what I do, the more I do, the more productive I am. Now, everybody will agree that people who have a passion for what they do will excel at what they do. But it's how do you coach people to turn on that passion? You know, in an interview, Will Chamberlain was interviewed, and everybody knew who this, who this guy is. He's just one of the greatest basketball players that ever played the game. And they asked him, what's the difference between a journeyman, an average player, and a great player. And his response was spirit, which in another word is passion. You know, you uh, I don't know if you've been looking at the, the last dance series with Michael Jordan, you can see the main difference between him and the other players was he had a, 
high passion for what he did. But a lot of people talk about passion, but nobody, has, I've never met or read about somebody who defined and clearly defined what this passion is all about. And that's but my so how, do we, how do we get that? Like, let's say for the average person who's living, uh, you know, just lack for, for lack of a better term, they're just living a normal um, or subpar life, right? They get up every day, they go to work, they come home, they spend a little bit of time with their family, they go to bed, they wake up, they do it over and over and over and over again. And they're not necessarily happy. They're just kind of surviving, right? They, they're making enough money to, to live in a nice home or in a nice neighborhood to provide for their family. But internally, they're just kind of whittling away. Like, how do you get that? How do you get to that place? Um, how do you get to that place where you, you know what I mean? Where you, where you, you know, I don't know, like, like start to take the, the steps or start to, um, move in the direction of, of that, of, you know, of this concept of passion of, of living in a passionate life. Well, I would recommend you get a copy of my book with passion. And this is not, you know, this is a book that anybody at any level, any edu can read and benefit from it. And it's a seven and a half step process. First, take pride in what you do, whatever it is that you do, take pride in what you do. And I'm not saying be proud, I'm saying take pride in what you do. At the end of the day, you can look back at your day and look in the mirror and say, I did my best today. You know, Dale Carnegie said, Better than my best, I cannot do. Less than my best, I will not do. I'm sure in your life, Hope, you've written a memo or you've done a, a, an email or whatever, and then you look at it before you hit the send button and you said, this is not going to work. This is not good enough. I need to do it over. That's kind of pride, your legacy. What do you represent? You. Not what other people tell you you should be, but what you should be. So too many people are trying to live other people's lives and not living their own life, take ownership. Yeah. So that's the first step, pride. The second step is attitude. It, everything starts in your head, your mindset. You know, your mindset. I have learned to look for the bright side of every situation. I f we find what we look for. If we look for the bright side, we're gonna find it. If we look for the dark side, we're going to find it, unfortunately. Most people, they see the dark side first and they get stuck there and they need some help to move out of there and look for, and you and I were talking about this COVID-19 virus right now and look at how much opportunities have evolved out of this situation. Companies, um, you know, make it, transferring their skills and making masks and other stuff and making revenue making the best of the situation. Me personally, I'm doing more online training now than I did before. Opportunity. Sure. But it's a mindset, you gotta look for it. And then the, the first S in passion is special. People who have a passion for what they do, they go out of their way to make other people feel special. But before you can make somebody feel special, you gotta know that you're special. But what's happening? The world is telling us to be special. They're telling the girls to be special. Your hair has to be a certain color. And you have to be a certain height and a certain shape and a certain perfect weight. And, they, and they're giving you products and they're selling products. And people are buying into this. The guys, they're telling them, you know, you got to be six foot two. You got to have a six pack, you know. And, and you got to be, they, they used to say, be, be like Mike. And, or, or go be a tiger until he messed up a little bit, you know. But you, who can be like you? There's only one of you. And I tell people there are only two reasons why you should know that you're special. Number one, you are created in the image of the almighty God. He created you in the all-powerful, all created you and me in his image. And he only made one of you, Hub. There's only one Hub Anderson in this whole wide world of over 8 billion people. And only one Lincoln Coke Ram in this whole wide world and in your audience, look in the mirror, people. There's only one of you in the whole wide world. That makes you unique, one of a kind, special. Now, who make other people feel special? The second S is service. 
people who have a passion for what they do, Herb, they don't work. They yes. don't work, they serve. Whatever they do is a service. Somebody has to clean that bathroom, that toilet. Somebody has to pick up the garbage. You know, every, you know, somebody has to do that. If they don't do it, what happens? So see whatever you do as a service to your fellow man. The I is initiative. People have a passion for what they, they do. Is they don't have to be told. They see something that needs to be done. They don't have to be told to do it. It doesn't have to be their job. It doesn't have to be their job description. They see something, you know, like when I do the live workshop, I like, to, I always get there early and I take a piece of paper and I rip it up in pieces and I scatter it on the floor. And I'm looking at the people come into the room to see who will pick up the paper on who, and I'm listening to what they're saying and this is what they're saying. What happened? They didn't clean the office today. The janitor took a day off, but there's always one or two people who will bend down, pick up the paper and find a garbage can and put it. That's initiative. Yes, sir. And they, and they do it with integrity. And again, who I've never met a human being who had, who told me, Lincoln, I don't have any integrity. I've met quite a few who profess to have integrity, but they need to go back and look at the definition of integrity. I found a very simple definition of integrity in a, a book by, um, by Alan Fine. You already know how to be great. And he said, say, do, co. Say what you're going to do, do what you said you were going to do and communicate when you can. That's integrity. For example, today, you and I were scheduled to meet at a certain time. Something came up and you wanted to meet a little later, and but you didn't leave me hanging. You contacted me and said, hey, Lincoln, can we move it later? And I said, sure. That's integrity. Simple like that. The O is ownership. Whose time is it now? This is our time. Whose world is this? This is our, this is not Donald, Donald Trump country. This is your country and my country. Let's make the best of it. Let's do our part. I remember, you know, remember Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Abraham Lincoln, government of the people, by the people and for the people. We are the people. Let us govern ourselves and let us make sure we are contributing, take ownership. This is my family, my duties, my responsibilities, my community, my church. Take ownership, my life, take ownership. And the end is never give up, never give up. Too many people, you know, they quit too early. And then one more swing, or one more call would have made that big sale, but they quit too early. But people have a passion for what they do. They never give up, Herb. They never give up. Yeah, man. I love that acronym and how you broke that down. Like that's, that's, I love that. I love those types of things because it gives you a kind of a roadmap, right? It gives you something to, to, yeah. to kind of to check and balance off of. And so I think that that's pretty clever. Now, kind of tying this uh, somehow into the car business, right? Because ultimately, I mean, we're on automotive podcast. Oh, yeah. Um, so, how do we do that with it within the automotive industry? I got to tell you something, man. Like I've seen, um, I've seen probably the best salesmanship at dealerships, and I've also seen the worst, right? I've seen <laughs> kind of, kind of both. No, I have seriously. Yeah. And, and, um, what is, um, in your opinion, like how do we, how do we, how, you know, just to kind of tie this into the car business? How do we motivate? Um, the people and not motivate because this is this is a little bit deeper than that but how do we kind of expand on the concept of passion in the car business in your that's, opinion that's a great question and i have a an excellent answer for you i went to this dealership to train the sales people on selling cars with passion i asked the guys what does society think about you guys how do they brand you and these car sales people were telling me, oh, they think we are scumbags. They think we are liars. They think we are gouges. They're, this is what they're telling me. So I said to them, so are you, are you going to allow that to continue? Or are you going to change that brand one customer at a time? And then I asked them, take a, a, and I gave them some, you know, three by five cards, index cards, and I said, write down a rule statement. What's your role as a salespeople person? 
and, and I get feedback like, well, I sell cars. One guy wrote, well, I sell the best import in the whole wide world. You know, and another, another guy said, well, I have people to find cars. And then there's this one guy. And he said, Mr. Lincoln, I provide reliable transportation to moms and dads so they can go on road trips, so they can go to work and come back home safe, so they can pick up, drop their kids off to school and bring and pick them up later. They can take them to the ball game to practice. And, and then, you know, he said, I, if I don't sell cars, those people who are working in the service department, the guy who sweeps the floor and keep the, the dealership clean, the receptionist, they're out of a work. So this guy, you know, see the big picture. I think our, our car sales people are like in the forest, they can't see the trees. And they need, they need to be exposed to what they're doing, their, their real role and how they, you know, I've been to so many dealerships. I myself have sold cars for a little while. And, and it's, when I was doing it, I was wondering why, why am I doing this? But I learned a lot. I learned a lot and I made a lot of sales. In fact, I won an award for you know, salesman of the month kind of deal. But it's how you treat people. A car or a vehicle is after your home is the second biggest item that an average human being will purchase. Think about, you know, when a, when a kid turns 16, what's the first thing they want? Tell me who. Yeah, yeah, car, drive, freedom. Well, I don't know, man. I, I've, I, I used to think that that was the answer, but I got to tell you, you took, uh, this is a kind of a, of a, of a, of a uh, segue or side note, but um, in my travels, man, I've noticed that a lot of the younger generation are more like Uber uh, people, right? They'd rather Uber than buy cars, and it kind of blows my mind. I'm like, what? Like, I could not wait till I was 16 to, to get my license and drive and stuff. So anyway, just... Well, well, they're going to, the younger people, while they're single, they might go and use you or when they start having a family and um, they have sad kids. You know, but the guy who is the Uber driver, he had to buy a car. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you no, know? for sure. Yeah. He had to buy a car and then pick up trucks and SUVs. You know, they had to buy a car. The auto industry, I mean, would always evolve. We will, it's a necessity. It's, in, it's a necessity, and maybe Uber would work in the big cities, in the inner cities, but in the country. And you notice more and more people are moving to the suburbs. More and more people are moving to the suburbs. This this business is here to stay. And yeah, we I, 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 I really enjoyed that direction here that you were taking it when you were talking about the car, right? Like, and here's kind of my 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 breakdown of, of, of what you said, but you know, there's some salespeople that just look at it as I'm going to go in there today and sell a car, right? That's my objective. I'm going to sell a car to make commission and that's it. Right. But then there's the other person like this, like this gentleman that gave you a real breakdown of how he sees his role. And they're like, you know what, I'm going to go in there today and I'm going to help somebody buy reliable transportation, right? So that they can do all these things in their life, right? So that they can have an impact in their life. Um, and I think that that's, dude, there's just, that's a better way to look at it. Right. I mean, that just really fires you up to, um, to serve. Right. And I, and I know this, this probably sounds cheesy or whatever, but I don't care. It's, it's, it's what I believe in because it's worked so much in my life. But when you serve, man, when you're really there to serve, everything just takes a, to a totally different, um, meaning in your life everything changes you know what i mean like when i was when i was with auto trader when i was selling uh, to, uh, into dealerships and stuff i never i was never afraid to walk into a dealership i was never afraid to cold call because i knew what i was there to do i was there to help you know what yeah. i mean and so and so it just it just if you look at it like that then 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 it's not work right because you know what you're there to do so I love that, man. I think that, that that makes all the difference in the world. It really puts a different perspective. And you know, you know who I, I coached and train a lot of the salespeople at Auto Trader, and I always tell them, fire yourself as an account executive. Fire yourself as a salesperson. Rehire yourself as a trusted business partner. You're yes. no, you're a trusted, everything that you do contributes to the business. 
You're a trusted business partner. Mr. Car Salesperson, fire yourself as a car salesperson. You're in business for yourself. You know, fortunately for you, you don't have to have to put up the capital to buy cars to sell. They're already there on the lot. Yes. You bring your skill and your talent and your personality, and you alone have. You alone have those skills and those talents and that personality. Use it to the max and benefit. I, I tell you, it's and it's, it's it's so much fun when you put somebody in a car and and you can see the, the, your face looks so happy. Yeah. I remember once once I I was this lady came into the dealership and she was looking for a convertible. Fortunately, there was a lake, a park close by the. So I took her on the drive, on the, you know, the park, the drive, and I took her to the lake. And I told her, park the car on the side of the lake and step, let's step out of the car. And I said, now look at the car and imagine yourself on a Saturday afternoon, having your car here, and taking a sun bath on your towel and enjoying your purchase. She bought the car. Yeah. <laughs> she bought I the car. The friendship, man. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, you know, it's, about, it's about knowing people and what they like and providing for them. You know, Zig Ziglar said, if you give people what they want in life, you will get what you want. Yeah. No, yeah. I totally agree with that for sure. I mean, so, again, how you treat people, that's how they're going to treat you. I can't tell you how many times people come into the dealership, we didn't close the deal. But they left and they went somewhere else and I get a phone call. Hey, Lincoln, we had this dealership and they're making us an offer. Can you match the offer? We want to do business with you. He, that's the thing. People buy the salesperson first. Sure. sure. Then they, they buy the product. Yeah, but I also think that uh, I think I agree with you. And I think that customers are are in tune with that. Like if you're really there to help them, I think that customers pick up on there versus just somebody that has commission breath and just wants to make a sale and just rush yeah. into the process so that they can sell you a car and get to the next one. You know what I mean? And so and I think in the car business and I think Ali Rita says this the best, but um, we don't wait the, the time allotted that we need to to to, you know, kind of get to that level where we're, where we're, where we're selling a lot of cars, but we're doing it efficiently and effectively where we're kind of building that, that, that repeat business. Right. Um, so let, let's kind of expand on this a little bit because I, I like where the conversation's at, but I want to, I want to talk about what happens when you get to that place, right. Where you feel like you're passionate about what you're doing. You have that extra, extra motivation every day to get out of bed and go out there and, 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 you know, and just do your thing. But then for whatever reason, it starts to taper off, right? Because that happens too. Um, and I've seen this in the, in the automotive industry a lot, like the, especially with, with green peas, right? They go in the first 90 days, they're, they're cranking, they're selling a lot of cars because they're listening to their managers. They don't have any bad habits. You know, they're, they're not jaded, obviously. Um, from, from, you know, watching all, all, everything that happens within the dealership, uh, and they're doing really well. And then you just start to see that decline. Um, so how do you, how do you, you know, how do you get to that state? But more importantly, how do you maintain it? Right. How do you make sure that you maintain it and you're still growing and evolving so that you can, um, obviously get to that next level, right? Cause that's part of human evolution. We can't just be stuck in, in this place because that's when we start to kind of get bored and, and all these things start to happen. Right. So how do you get to a state of passion, but most importantly, how do you keep that, keep that going beyond that? Uh, and you know, that's awesome. Herb. I believe in my heart of heart, everybody needs a mentor. I will encourage everybody find a mentor. Somebody who when when you know when you have who will share your joys and your successes, and somebody who will you can call when you're in that getting into that hole who will help, talk you out of it, and then also leaders. See, this is where leadership comes in. It's not all about numbers. It's about the people who generate the numbers for you. You sure. need to be, you need to be aware of your people. And you can, you need, you know, 70% of communication is nonverbal. When you, Mr. Sales Manager, make eye contact with you, you should know 
This person is not having a good day. What can I do to help this person have a better day? You know, they say recognition and appreciation should be served like champagne while it's still bubbling. I love that, man. I've never heard that before. I think that's awesome. Yeah. Look, how you want to get, how you want to, to encourage people to continue doing well, you catch them doing well. And in the moment, you recognize them. And you don't just say, good job. What a cliche. I like how you handle that customer. I like how you connected with that customer. I like how you were engaging with that customer. And I noticed how you did not neglect his wife, but you involved her in the conversation. That's be specific. Now you're encouraging this person. Now this person can't wait for the next call. Yeah. Again. I, I want to interject on this one because this is something that I've I, I've learned and, and you know kind of in my in my um, experience is um, spe specific means genuine, right? Amen. Specific means genuine. When you give somebody a specific compliment, and you're not like just a generic good job sort of a deal, but you're specific about your compliment, it really showcases that you care. It showcases that you paid attention. And it just it just comes across as genuine. It just has a much deeper impact. And so I like that you said that because I think that that's that's definitely something missing within the automotive industry. And I think that um, from the leadership aspect, that that could make a, a world of a difference for sure. For, and then you know, in the automotive industry, the majority of the salespeople in the automotive industry is a job. It's mm -hmm. a stopgap situation. Something I can do while I'm looking for something better. While in that same dealership, there are people who are making three, six figures. Sure. What they More, see. Man, like, there's if you're if you're you know there's there's those those echelon I would say salespeople that dude they're crushing it. You know what I mean? And and but but they've all they didn't just wake up there, dude. That's the other thing. You know what I mean? Like it's they build and they they've built that um the, the they've earned the right you sort of speak you know what i'm saying so well not only that they were caught properly in that somebody had sat down with them and showed them, just like this yourself. is not yeah. a job this is a career people yeah. don't buy one car in their lifetime you know i mean you hope how many cars have you bought in your lifetime i'm sure it's about 20. sure yeah yeah. You know, and, and in, in any business, repeat business is what sustains that business. So, and then referrals, you know, and you, I tell you, <laughs> referrals, people will refer you if you're good at what you do, if they like you, if they trust you. you got to make yourself likable and trustworthy. And how you do that, you follow up on people. You don't just at the end, you know, they close, they, they leave and you forget about them. No. I, you know what bothers me a lot when I drive by an auto dealership? Even today, I see these salespeople outside standing up or sitting down, reading the newspaper and waiting instead of being inside on the phone or on their computer, sending emails, making Facebook posts. Hey, we just got this beautiful car. Here's a picture. Somebody, you know. That's you, a lack of passion, man, right yeah, there. <laughs> use the technology that's available to you. For sure. Yeah. Dude, I, I love it. And uh, listen, I know we're getting close to that time. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to have this conversation with me. Um, and I, I, I want to give you a, a little bit to tell us about what you've got coming on here in, in the next couple of weeks. But before we do that, I kind of want to end kind of end things here with a, with a, a question on mentorship, because that really kind of struck a chord with me here as we were as we were uh um, as I was hearing you. So, um, do you believe, and this is kind of a multi-part question, so forgive me, but I'm, I'm no, 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 go ahead. for the sake of time here. Um, do you believe that meant that you could have effective mentorship within the car business, right? Is that possible? And if so, how do you do that? Like I'm, I'm new to the business, right? First day on the job. I want to grow. I want to succeed. I don't know what I'm doing. The dealership provides for the most part, I shouldn't say that. I'm not going to generalize. Some dealerships don't provide a lot of training, you know, but I'm hungry, man. I want to go after it. And so my, my, my mind goes, okay, who can I partner up with in here that's going to teach me that that can take me under their wing? So 
Do you believe that mentorship uh, is something that exists within the automotive industry? And if so, how do I do that? How can I effectively set up myself with a mentor in a, in a dealership that's going to get me to that next level? Well, there are two types of mentors. There's the incidental mentor, meaning people you can observe what they do and learn from observation what they do. And then there is the close mentor. It doesn't have to be somebody in the dealership because the dealership, is, they will teach you how the products, you know, and the pros and cons and the value and all the different gadgets on the product and how to deliver the car and how to do a, a sales assessment, all of that, how to fill out the, the sales order. But a mentor will teach you how to be trustworthy how to enjoy what you do, how to help people to, to make people like you and trust you. And it does not have to be somebody for, from this. It's because, I mean, you know, most of the, the leaders in the, and I don't want to generalize like you, but most of them, they have in, inherited the business. They grew up in the business. That's all they know. Sure, sure. And, they need, they themselves need some mentoring and some coaching. They themselves need some mentoring and some coaching. And they, you know, it's amazing how they appreciate it when they, when they, the thing about mentoring and coaching, first, you got to admit, I need help. I need a mentor. I need a coach. The moment that's 50% right there, the moment you do that, then that mentor would come to you. Because now you're looking, now you're aware of, I'm looking for a mentor. I need a mentor. Be very specific about who you choose to be your mentor. Choose wisely who you want to be your mentor. And you're going to be transparent with your mentor. And you know what happens after a time hope? It's now an equal. It starts as a mentor-mentee relationship. But after a time, it's an equal relationship. And the mentor is mentoring the mentee, and then the mentee starts mentoring the mentor. And it's a long-term relationship. This is not a short-term relationship. My current me mentor, I met him in 1995. And we meet once a month. In fact, I spoke to him on the phone today. And we keep in touch. So it's a key role in life. Some of us, our, our parents, our mentor, they were not even aware that they were mentoring us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I want to interject in that too, because I think that the mentor mentee relationship kind of takes a weird turn. Like the mentee feels that they have to, there's some, they're somehow not worthy, right? Um, because like, if I'm a new, if I'm new to the sales floor and I don't know what I'm doing, how can I go up to the guy that's selling 50 cars a month? And, 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 you know, I have nothing to offer, but that's not, that's not it, man. I mean, uh, the relationship is, um, you know, th they're going to teach you th things. And in the process of doing that, they're going to learn themselves, right? Because what we don't, what we don't recognize sometimes is that as we teach others, we ourselves oh, kind of, yeah. um, you know, solidify our knowledge. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, just by going through that process. And so uh, uh, if, if that, if that, that um, relationship if the opportunity to have the relationship is there, what I'm trying to say is I, I just encourage you to go up to this person and ask and be like, Hey, listen, you know, I love what you're doing. I can see that you're killing it month in month out. I would love the opportunity to learn for you. I'm willing to learn, you know, to, to, to be a sponge. Um, and, and, you know, and I, and in return, what I promise to do is I promise to do all the things that you taught me to do. Right. As far as, um, you know, the process or whatever, to not waste your time, to always be cognizant of your time and appreciative of your time. And 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 uh, that goes a long way, man. You'd be surprised how people are like, you know, willing and, and able to do those things. And that's the difference between kind of making it or, you know, going through that 90 day period and then being like, no, I'm not cut out for this. sort yeah. of a day. Yeah. And, you know, the thing about it really it, is. we all life is a stage. And we are all on stage and people are looking at us. And we are all have a specific role to play. The mentee role is a specific role. If you if if I come if you come to me and you said, Hey Lincoln, I'd like for you to be my mentor, and we talk and I say oh, we agree. Now you have to take ownership of that relationship. 
You have to say, you know, when can we meet? I will ask you questions like, how would you, how often would you like to meet with me? Weekly, monthly? Would you like to talk on the phone or you want to do Zoom meetings or you want to have in-person meetings? Because that's what, the, but you, the mentee now, you have to initiate the meeting because I don't want to be a burden on you, the mentee. When you need me, call me, I'm available. The mentor has to respond within a reasonable time. That mentee call you, you call them back the same, the same day because they need you. That's a human being, a fellow human being that, is, that need you. So you return that call the same day. Yes, sir. Simple things like that will make a great mentor-mentee relationship. And yeah. the other thing is, you know, your mentor does not have to be the number one salesman in the organization. It can be the number two or the number three or just somebody who's been around and have their experience. Yeah, no, I love that. That's a great point too. Dude, thank you so much for doing this. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks for experimenting with me on our very first uh, YouTube live. Oh, I love um, it. I want to give you an opportunity. To, I know you got some stuff coming up, so I want to make sure that you can uh, tell folks about that. And then we're also going to put it in the description. Any links? We're gonna we're gonna tell you how to get in touch with Lincoln. It says phone number, um, everything that you, so you can reach out to him if you have any questions. So if you don't catch it here, make sure to go to the descriptions and and uh, definitely reach out to my to my friend here, Lincoln, and connect with him. Um, I think that you would be. Um, you know, you, you do yourself a favor to um, t taking a look at what, what he has to offer. So tell us about what's coming up, man. Thank you, Hoop. But I'm available to do any virtual presentations and, and, and training. I have coming up a Selling with Passion workshop online. The first session starts on July 7th, and it's going to be running for seven consecutive Tuesdays, two sessions. So people have two time slots, 12 to 1. Eastern time and eight to nine at night, Eastern time. So that's what's coming up immediately. Um, I do, I love what I do. Uh, I don't charge exorbitant fees. I'm very reasonable. In fact, I love what I do so much. Sometimes I'll do it for free. Yeah, and, that's passion right there, folks. <laughs> oh yeah, you know? And then in, before I say goodbye, there's one thing I want to leave with, with everybody who is listening here, you. You are the star in the movie of your life. Make every day an Oscar winning performance. Thank you very much. God bless you. And be the best that you were designed to be. That's awesome, dude. Thank you. Thank you so much again for doing this. I really, really appreciate it. Um, that's all we got, folks. Um, again, we're going to be doing a couple of these, um, you know, between now and September, just because. Uh, um, you know, I want to kind of expand a little bit and, and talk about other things that are not necessarily, um, just about auto, the automotive industry, but maybe branch out a little bit. So make sure to tune in. Um, and Lincoln, again, thanks for doing the first one with me, dude. Appreciate it. You're welcome, man. All right, everybody. Thanks so much. That's all we got. And as usual, we'll talk later.